Beta, on your whiteboard, what is it called when you're lying in a massage and you're kind of awake and kind of not, but you're like, oh my God, this is wonderful. I'm so comfy. And you're like drift in and out of sleep. What type of waves are you in? I don't care about stages too much. I care about waves. What do you got, Matt? Theta. Theta. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is... Uh, please tell me what type of waves are when you are pretty much dead to the world asleep and there is no coming out of it. No, you don't need to put them in order, darling. I don't care about it until Wednesday. I said that to you. You didn't listen. Hannah. Delta. On your whiteboard, please tell me what REM stands for. Mary Kate, your uh, effort is off the charts. Mary Kate, what is it? Rapid eye movement. On your whiteboard, please tell me. Oh, it was coming. Thank you. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is it called when you cannot sleep or you cannot stay asleep? You cannot get to sleep and you cannot stay asleep. Eva. Insomnia. Insomnia. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is... Uh, please tell me what type of, uh, what is it called when you kind of jolt just after you fall asleep? What is that called? Good. Brittany. Sleep spindles. All right. So today we're going to wrap up. I do have a video clip for you today, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I just need to know where we left off. I'm pretty sure we left off in disorders. Um, did we get to sleep apnea yesterday? Yeah. Okay, so insomnia is when you cannot sleep. You guys got that one? Mm -hmm. Sleep apnea is when you have trouble breathing while you're sleeping. And I have a video clip for you. Oh, it's because it's not plugged in. That's why you can't hear anything. I know, it's super intense music for no reason, but, you know. <laughs> I snore. Just because you snore does not mean you have sleep apnea. When everyone has sleep apnea, snore. As you can hear, he's having trouble breathing, can't catch his breath. severe sleep apnea. It literally blocks and stops air from at, um, reaching the body and you can die of it. Most people who have uh, sleep apnea have a little sleeping machine where they have an oxygen mask where they wear every single night and the machine is actually loud on purpose to keep you from getting in too deep of a sleep so your brain can, uh, so you're not falling into like complete snores and complete relaxation. Yes. So that's a good question because you have a specific way you fall asleep, correct? That's it. Whatever you found comfort in as a kid, that's it. Um, some people do like um, tie themselves down to try to help avoid it. In your poorer countries where people have it, where they don't have access to machines and stuff like this, they typically tie themselves into one spot. But you can die of it. Um, it's really hard because if you're comfortable in one spot, even if you're like, okay, I'm totally going to stay on my side and not lie on my back, where are you going to be when you're trying to get comfy? Whatever. On your back, absolutely, and that's the big problem. All right, um, your other major disorder is going to be narcolepsy. Okay, now narcolepsy is a sleep disorder in which a person continuously falls into REM sleep uh, and falls immediately into it without, uh, during the day without warning. We have a video clip for you. His name is Rusty. And this is people's favorite video of the entire year. I mean, I have some good ones, I'm just going to say. I don't think this is my best video, but it is one of my favorites. This dachshund, Rusty, Aww. suffers from narcolepsy, a condition that causes him to suddenly fall asleep when he's trying to do other things. Who <laughs> has known about the cause of narcolepsy, except that it can be inherited. It affects humans and animals alike. 
I think we need to see it again, right? Yeah. Yeah. This dachshund, Rusty, suffers from narcolepsy, a condition that causes him to suddenly fall asleep when he's trying to do other things. Little is known about the cause of narcolepsy, except that it can be inherited. Apparently, one of my kids was like, Miss Bennett, that wasn't the best Rusty video. I've seen better ones. I'm sure there is. In 17 seconds, does it get to the point? Yes. That's all I need. That's all. I literally know a dog that has narcolepsy, and he'll, he'll run up and down stairs and just fall asleep, like, down the stairs and ram his face, like... <laughs> it's really dangerous. I mean, obviously that video makes it to be a lot lighter, because it's a dog running through the field, and that's adorable. It's also very, very dangerous, especially, like, living in our normal lives, walking, doing stuff like that. Uh, every time you fall, you have risk of damaging your head. There's a lot of like videos out there that show like the side effects of it. Yeah, it's funny that someone could just like fall asleep, but I mean, you really do harm yourself every time you fall and all those different types of things. It uh, stops you from being independent. Think about it. I mean, if you're at home and you just fall and you have the stove going, guess what's going to happen? You burn down your house and all these different types of things. So it is, uh, it is actually a very, very, very scary thing. Um, okay, dreams. Freud. Okay, every single one of you have had a really weird dream that you've woken up and said, what the hell was that? Can we agree? Yeah. Absolutely. Every single human on earth has experienced it. So think about that super weird dream and how you felt. Freud would say, you want that to happen in your real life. I know, and everyone's like, oh my god, no, I would not ever want that. Freud believes dreams are our brain's ability to see what we want and kind of live that life. Okay? That whatever we dream is what we want. That's what he believes. Freud's going to keep popping up throughout all of psychology. This is something you do need. You need to write this down. You will see it again. You might as well learn it the first time. Now, when we talk about dreams, we talk about dreams in two different contexts. Manifest content and Latin content. Manifest content is when the uh, manifest is the actual content itself. So if I had a dream last night that a bear was chasing me through the woods, that is the manifest content. I am running through the woods and there's a bear chasing me. The Latin content is the true hidden meaning of the dream. So last night I had a dream that a bear was chasing me through the woods and a dream interpreter would say, actually the bear represents your mother and her shame and uh, her feelings of anger towards the fact that you will not reproduce. So she's chasing you down through your life, hoping you will have grandbabies for her. Latin content. My mom wants me to have grandbabies. <laughs> no, I have a puppy, that's enough. Um, Latin content is the true hidden meaning of a dream. So the bear represents my mom. This is dream analysis, okay? I will tell you right now, I don't care about dreams. Do not come to me and ask me, oh my god, Miss Bennett, I had a dream last night that a chandelier came to life. What does that mean? I don't know. I don't know. Google it. Find whatever you answer you like. Take that and go with it. I have no idea. Don't ask me about your dreams because I don't know. What you do need to know, what I do know, is that manifest content is what the actual storyline of the dream. I'm getting chased by a bear. The Latin content is the hidden meaning of the dream that has to be interpreted, that the bear represents my mother, and the forest represents the shame because I haven't given her grandbabies. <laughs> She's not getting it. Okay, so activation synthesis. Okay, activation synthesis believes that dreams are created by higher centers of the cortex that is just completely random bursts in our brain. Okay? It's completely random. We have no control over our dreams. They just happen to have electrical activity in a certain place. Activation information mode is the belief that we can put information into our brain if we think about something beforehand. Have you ever had a conversation about something super weird or someone you haven't thought about in a while, and then your dream that night they show up? That topic, that idea, that concept? No? Yeah. Okay? That's called activation information mode. That essentially part of your dreams are taken from real life and real ideas. Okay? Both activation information mode and activation synthesis believe that brains are... Uh, brains. Dreams are created by bursts of electrical activity in different parts of your brain. Whatever they're fixing, so if they're fixing this part of my brain that has my childhood memories, then I would have a dream of my childhood where maybe I you know, beat up the kid I really wanted to beat up or something like that, you know, whatever it is, okay? That has really no meaning, 
but your brain likes closure, which is having round stories, having finished thoughts, and they finish it, fill in the details in order to make it make more sense. But can we all agree when you sit there and try to rationalize your dreams, they make no sense? <coughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not going to be a circus performer. I have no talents. So if I dream about being a circus performer tonight, it's ridiculous because I can't even walk in a straight line. How could I do anything else? Okay? Based on whatever I want. All right, hypnosis. Um, my la last class did not do well with this. They were uh, very disappointed. Hypnosis is a state of consciousness in which a person is especially susceptible to suggestion. Susceptible to suggestion. Okay? Anyone here ever seen a hypnotist? Like in life, in like a real life? Yourself or like watching someone? Watch someone. You've seen, have you been, anyone here been hypnotized? Okay. You, where were you, like on a carnival cruise or something? Yeah. Okay. Okay, how did they ask? Did they ask, hey, does anyone want to be hypnotized? Um, did they ask people to volunteer? Yeah. Yes! Step one. Okay? You can only hypnotize someone who wants to be hypnotized. Okay? So if you're like on a carnival cruise, and they're, you know, I have no idea really, really where you are, but I've seen one on a carnival cruise, and I left. Okay? And wherever you are, hypnotists typically ask for volunteers. And you all, they're always going to pick the guy who's like, me, me, I want to be, yes, make it, pick me. And they're going to be like, you, sir, you come with me. And they're like, yes. And they're like high-fiving everyone on the way in. I think we can all agree. Is that exactly pretty much what happened? Yeah. See, it always happens. I think we can all agree. Whoever that guy is wants to be the center of attention. Can we agree? Hello? Mm -hmm. If you're losing your mind trying to get selected and then clapping everyone's hands on the way down, yeah, you are not shy. <laughs> okay? So, when they're up there, okay, and they're doing, you are getting very sleepy. When I snap my fingers, you will be asleep. Okay? And they, like, drop their head and stuff like that. They are making the decision in their head to follow it or not. The hypnotist is not in their head controlling their behavior. That would be crazy. Don't you think our U.S. government, our military would use that against other people? If we could just say you're getting sleepy and snap you in and then we can make you blow up other people, wouldn't we use that as a weapon? Or do we use hypnotism as a weapon? <laughs> no, no, you have to be a willing participant. So when someone's up there, you know, dancing like a chicken, whatever, what, what do they make them do? I feel like maybe like after they make them talk like their feet were so much bigger than their whole body, so they were all like trying to walk in like So if you are dying to be the center of attention, and you are given the opportunity to be the center of attention, but you're not under your own control, <coughs> so you're completely not yourself because you can get away with it, guess what you're going to do? It was cool, like, the people in the audience, like, they, like he told them that like, everyone to play along, and, like, 20 people in the audience was out, too. Because people are idiots. This and they're, they're on a carnival so cool, cruise, so they're probably drunk anyway. <laughs> no, it was kids. Some kids were there. Weirdos. They More also attention. want to be center of attention. Huh? <laughs> no. Okay? And that's the thing. When you talk about hypnotism, you have to have the belief in wanting to do it. If someone tried to hypnotize me, it wouldn't work. Because I'd be like, this is stupid. No. 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 And because I would reject, it's all about suggestion. Now, if you pay to be hypnotized, you go to be hypnotized, you pay your $450 to be hypnotized not to smoke. Okay? Because some people do it. You're going out of your way to be hypnotized because you believe it will work and help cure your problem. So you go, you pay a fortune of money. And next time you see a cigarette that's not like, you're like, ah, or whatever they teach you to do, you're like, ah, oh, man, I just spent $450 on someone to tell me I shouldn't smoke. Ah, I'm broke now. <laughs> and I can't buy my cigarettes. Ta-da. Anyway. What about if you have, like, PTSD and, like, things trigger you? PTSD, with the trigger and the hypnotism, it's about soothing the mind and calming it down. When you talk about PTSD and hypnosis, they talk about the hidden observer 
which is under hypnosis of dissociation. It allows your brain to kind of switch in between two. It essentially, when we get to dissociation, which is in psychological disorders, which is at the very end of the year, dissociation, if you listen to me now and kind of process it, it's kind of a weird thing. Dissociation is when your brain essentially splits into two personalities. There's not a real split. The biology is the same, but essentially your brain splits into two personalities. We have identity, disor identity dissociation disorder, which is your multiple personalities. We don't call it that anymore. We call it identity dissociation disorder. It's essentially you have multiple personalities in your brain, and they kind of go from one to the other to the other. I have a crazy video on it. Some real ch English chick. Oh my God. Yeah, but we have to get there. We're not there yet. Okay, so when we have hypnosis for people with PTSD, they kind of teach them how to kind of put the PTSD in a separate personality. So it's kind of like the flipping of stuff like that. They're not under hypnosis. It's not like they're like, and you won't feel it anymore. But it's kind of, it's a long-term therapy that allows them to kind of separate themselves in a kind of different way, which is true. We all have that hidden observer in our head that kind of, have you ever, like, as you're doing something, you're like, yeah, you shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. Okay, it's not always. Sometimes, like, you feel more strongly than having, like, your moral guidepost, you know, that little voice in your head. Your ego, which is what it's called. Your conscience is what we call it in psychology. Um, they're always telling you in your head, and sometimes it sounds a little bit stronger and a little bit different, and you're like, oh, man, I should really listen to that, and then you do something stupid anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah? People that take the test. Huh? It's people that take the test. Oh, and you're like, ah, oh, man, I should do this, but you do the other? Okay. Um, that is like your hidden observer. That in your head at any time, like you could separate it out. It's kind of a cool concept. Okay, that's what that's about. Can PTSD be helped with hypnosis? Absolutely. When you go on a carnival cruise and there's some guy in the front, nah. Nah, they want to be the center of attention. And that's why they're acting that way, because they can get away with it. Oh, it wasn't me acting like a chicken. <laughs> me under hypnosis. No, you idiot. Okay. So, social cognitive. Okay, can we do drugs now? Yes. Actually, let's do a quick uh, review on the board. On your whiteboard. Oh. On your whiteboard, please tell me. I, what am I experiencing? Oh my god, I'm so excited. Oh. If you just like actually fell. Like really no, not like no. oh First of all, I know I would get a concussion. Let's just be honest. Yeah, what is it? Narcolepsy. Um, my husband uh, was in the kitchen making milkshakes at 2 o'clock in the morning when I asked him, what the hell were you doing at 2 o'clock in the morning? He has no recollection. AC. Symbolism. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is it called when I believe that the clowns are going to come out of the woods and eat me. What the hell is that? Valeria, nightmare. <laughs> On your whiteboard, I'm falling and I can't get up. What? What? What is it? Bella. Night terror. All right, can we do drugs now? Yes. All right, here we go. So when we talk about psychoactive drugs, we're talking about drugs that alter your thinking, your perception, and your memory. When I say Advil, is that a psychoactive drug? No. No. It's based off of ibuprofen. Ibuprofen helps with your bones, your muscles, your joints, and stuff like that. It has no psychological effects. So if you're at home and thinking, ah, man, let's get wild tonight, <laughs> ibuprofen is not the drug for you, okay? That's going to make you, you can get sick, of course, from it, so I'm not trying to make jokes about it, but it's not going to do anything. Psychoactive drugs are going to be ones that specifically focus on your mind. Now, when we talk about drugs, we have to talk about it in two different contexts, the physical dependence and the psychological dependence. First of all, physiological has two components. The first one is tolerance. Tolerance is, the more you take the drug, the less of an effect it has on you. So for instance, uh, the most common example is going to be with alcohol. On your 21st birthday, when you have your first beer, you're going to get drunk off one beer. 
and you're gonna puke all 12 ounces of it up and you'll be like, ah oh, man, 21, ha, okay? So by the time you get to your 22nd birthday, you'll be able to have two beers without getting drunk and without getting, uh, being throwing up. So you only have to throw up 24 ounces, that's nice. You've already doubled your tolerance level by the time, and 23 is gonna get real wild. Three beers, things are gonna get wild. Tolerance means it takes more beer by the time you get to 23 in order to get drunk, okay? Same thing with Advil. If you are someone who it takes a lot of Advil because you have a lot of sports injuries, a lot of stuff like that, have you noticed the Advil doesn't work as much? And you have to bump up the Advil? And then you're supposed to only take two, but now you're taking three? First of all, if you're doing that, you need to talk to your doctor. Big thing. Uh, my husband, he gets really bad migraines because he looks like a computer screen all the time. Um, and uh, so he used to take two Advil. Now he's up to four because it's been so bad because three Advils no longer work, so now he's on four. So he is going to the doctor to get a better prescription to make sure he's okay because you're not supposed to be taking four Advil. That's a tolerance. For me, I don't take that much medication. I only take medication if I'm really, really sick or if I'm in really, really bad pain. And one Advil, I can feel it. Two Advil, I'm like, oh my goodness, whew. I'm a new woman because I never use it, okay? I have a very low tolerance for Advil, so when I take it, I feel better immediately. That's called tolerance, yes? All right. Withdrawal. Now, withdrawal is a very serious thing. When your body gets used to something and you take it off, it doesn't know how to function. Uh, we've talked about uh, when people use melatonin, when people go to the grocery store and pick up melatonin for themselves, it is awful. Don't do it. Talk to your doctor before you take any regimen of anything, especially melatonin. Because what happens is your brain develops a tolerance for melatonin. So the first time you take the melatonin drops, you're going to sleep really what you think is well, but you're not going to have a genuine REM sleep. Then the, after a couple months, you're going to need more. Then you're going to need more. Then, eventually, you're going to be like, you know what, I'm so sick of buying these pills, I can't afford it anymore, I'm not going to take it, you don't buy any more pills, and now, all of a sudden, you cannot sleep. You cannot sleep because your body has created a dependence on those melatonin pills. That your body cannot sleep without them because your body has stopped producing melatonin in order to help you sleep because your body was getting all this fake melatonin to replace it. And it causes a huge problem. Alcohol. If your body depends on alcohol in order to have those basic functions and all that stuff, when you remove alcohol, you literally shake because your body doesn't know how to function without it. And if you take cocaine, meth, meth and heroin are destroying the New England right now. It's a huge epidemic. So many people are being uh, killed uh, because withdrawing is really, really painful. Don't ever be arrested. <laughs> However, if you are arrested, one of the worst things and the scariest things about being arrested and sitting in county jail waiting to be processed is listening to people going through withdrawals. Because if you are arrested and you're addicted to something, they don't give you anything to curb it. If you are a citizen who does not get in trouble for drug use and you go to your doctor, they can give you drugs to help you cut down on the withdrawals. But if you're arrested, you're literally icing out. Have you ever heard that expression? You're being iced out. That means you're literally in a seclusion as you literally scream and roll around in pain because your body is trying to get the drug out of its system and it's become incredibly painful. It literally hurts, especially with heroin. Your brain doesn't know how to function and messes it up. And it literally feels like you have like fire going through your veins because all of a sudden your neurotransmitters are freaking out because they don't have the drug that they need. That's why people who are incredibly addicted to stuff stay addicted. People who take meth like the high, but they're afraid of the crash. That's why people who stay, take meth stay on meth. It's not because they love the feeling. It's because going out of meth and when you come off the drug, just like everything, there's a peak and then it comes down. The fall is harsh and painful and really excruciating. So, in order to avoid the fall, what do you do? Take more meth. Guess what? Your tolerance goes up, so you need more meth. Guess what happens? The higher your, the more meth you take, the harder the 
fall. So guess what happens? People would rather commit suicide or take an over, uh, literally <coughs> overdose on meth so they don't have to feel the pain of coming down. That is what withdrawal is. And that is how scary it is. And that is what is happening up north. The foster homes in Massachusetts are exploding right now. They're even taking kids out of Massachusetts for the first time out of foster care and bringing them to four regional states because there are so many adults with kids who are dying of uh, addiction because they'd rather get high because they can't deal with the pain coming down. That is why addiction is so scary. Okay? And then you have the psychological dependence. Now, psychological dependence is when you uh, have a feeling that the drug is needed to continue feeling of emotional or psychological well-being. I have a psychological dependence to beer and sporting situations. When I'm watching a sport, <laughs> you need a beer. I love having a beer. I'm like, I don't really drink. I really don't. It's not really my thing. But if I go to like a baseball game, I have to have a beer and a hot dog. Like, I feel like, a, like America, man. <laughs> you know? So if I'm at the stadium, and that, we have season tickets, but we never go. Um, my husband sells them. And um, I think I've gone to two games this year. It's okay. The rings are awful. Um, with that psychological dependence, when I go during the week, I don't drink during the week. Okay? It's just no thing to do. I barely drink on the weekends. Definitely don't drink during the week. But when I'm sitting in the stadium on, like, a Tuesday... And like we're there at the game watching terrible baseball. I'm like, oh my god, I should get a beer. Like I'm at a baseball game. What's more American than having a beer at a baseball game? And I'm like, ah oh, man, I should get a beer. And like I feel like this like weirdo because I'm like, ah oh, man, I should have a beer. That's a psychological dependence. Okay, I don't really drink truly, but on Sundays if I'm watching football, if I'm at home, I'm kind of like, ah oh, man, I wish we had beer in the house. You know, it's like I feel like you're a real American with a beer in your hands when you're 21, of course. So that is my psychological dependence. When you turn 21, it's fun having a beer at the game because you feel like, ah, America. Psychological dependence. You don't need it. My mom had a psychological dependence to smoking when she was younger. My mom only would smoke when she would go out to the bar with the girls. My dad never saw my mom smoke, ever. But my mom said she smoked for like 10 years. Every time they'd go out to the bar with the girls, she would have a couple drinks and start smoking. But she never left work to smoke. She would never smoke at home. She would never smoke anywhere. She'd have a couple beers, and she would be like, ah, let's have a cigarette. By the way, my mom is like the most like straight-laced person you've ever met. Yeah, that's literally what all my mom's friends do. Like really? My mom yeah. like smokes cigarettes. I'm a social like, smoke. But her friends literally like ask me on the phone because I had to come be their Uber the other day and they're like, bring us cigarettes. Don't tell our husbands. We just want to smoke. And I was like, why? They're like, we just had it feels right. Like, so <laughs> and that's what a psychological defense. If you're not doing it, then it's weird. And that's what a psychological dependence is. A lot of people feel, um, a lot of people who don't drink, like an adult over 21 who don't drink, feel weird in social situations where there's lots of drinking going on. Does that make sense? Like, when I have people over, like, for parties and stuff, the first thing, hey, do you want red or white wine? And people who don't drink, they say, oh, I'm not drinking, and it's not a big deal. But, like, the fact is, after you get to 21, you're always going to be offered, hey, beer, wine, what can I get for you? As soon as you sit in a restaurant, they're assuming you're going to drink. So it's this weird kind of thing, and that's the psychological dependence. People feel like they have to drink when they're with other people, stuff like that. It's got it. So it's like struggle with alcoholism absolutely absolutely if you have alcoholism if you develop it like my McCray's dad has, is an alcoholic he's a recovering alcoholic he's been sober now for 27 years he got sober and McCray uh, was young and um, it's really hard for him he only hangs out with other AA members that's it he goes on cruises with only AA members, and they all keep each other strong. It's a really weird thing. I have a couple friends that I know that are recovering alcoholics, and it's the right choice. They're living a greater life, but they all, when I invite them to come join like a group of us, they'll say, no, thank you. But if I invite them over to my house, and we're just having like a low-key, normal night, they'll come. But they just don't like the idea of being surrounded. When you're over 21, it's very common to have alcoholic drinks. Not that it's crazy, but like, hey, you want a glass of wine? And it's really hard. It is really hard. Which, you know, it's psychological dependence. People are like, oh, yeah, well, we're all together. We might as well. Oh, it's a Tuesday. 
Hey, Taco Tuesday. Like, McCray cannot go to Taco Tuesday without a margarita. <laughs> That's why we don't go to Taco Tuesday that often. Okay. All right. So, stimulants are drugs that increase. Stimulants increase. I would write under stimulants active because every single thing can kind of be boiled down to one major thing. Now, stimulants make you more active. If you're on a stimulant, you're not hanging out at home. Hey, how are you? You're not. You're like, hi, hi. Oh, wow, nice to see you. Nice to see you. One of the big ones is amphetamines. Now, amphetamines is what is being abused by some of your professional players. There are two major ways our professional baseball players, basketball players, football players, Olympians are drugs. They're doing human growth hormone, which makes your body recover faster, which makes you stronger in the long run, and amphetamines. People who use amphetamines have more energy. <coughs> Here we go. All right. It actually makes you respond quicker and faster because your brain is firing at a much faster rate because your brain is fully stimulated. People who say they're on amphetamines feel like, ah, I'm in control of everything in my brain. I can feel everything. And I'm like, yeah, totally in tune to everything that is happening. That is what amphetamines do. Now, cocaine is probably the most famous of your stimulants. Okay? Cocaine is a natural drug. It produces a euphoria, energy, power, and pleasure. People who take cocaine are not sitting at home on a Tuesday night. Okay? They are going to the club. They are doing something all, like, something all night long. Okay? They need the energy, they need the motion, they need it. What happens, apparently, I, wait a minute, I drink like two beers a week, so I ain't taking cocaine. Okay? <laughs> when you take cocaine, you feel like you have all the energy, and you're like, ah, ah, here we go, ah, and you just can do anything. Like, you are just, here we go. And it's like the greatest. I've never <laughs> taken it. <laughs> and it is just, woo, here we go. And you are just on. And you're just like, it's like a light inside just goes on. And you're just, woo, here we go. That's why people who go to like dance clubs and all that stuff take cocaine. While you rave, all that stuff, it is cocaine. It is what makes people feel like just as high as a kite. What? You just suck. You're like, am I Dance clubs. <laughs> I think I went to a dance club twice in my life. <laughs> Never again. That is not my scene. Okay. Nicotine is the most uh, second most common of your uh, stimulants. Apparently, if you've ever, I hope not, but nicotine, if you've ever taken a hit off of like a cigarette or something, it is one one thousandth of the high you get off of cocaine. It is significantly less. Every time you take a hit off a cigarette, you get this little burst of pain of like, whew, whew, whew. Okay, every time you take a hit off the nicotine, it kind of gives you this like buzzing sensation. Um, and the most common stimulant is of course caffeine. My husband is straight up addicted to caffeine. Every single morning when McCray is home, because he works a lot out of town, when he's home, I make him a cup of coffee. We have like a really fancy espresso machine, because when we went to Italy, he got addicted to um, espresso. So we got like a really fancy coffee machine. I made him coffee this morning. Um, I left the house at 6.15. My husband was at Starbucks getting his first venti uh, black iced coffee, no cream, no sugar, at uh, 6.45 then I know he will be there three more times. That's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. That's just so much money. He needs to just get one in his office. Or... No, he likes the little walk. He gets like, he gets shaky. If he it's doesn't like have going a cigarette. It's like going out for a cigarette. Like, it's like a cigarette break. He has a psychological dependence and a physiological. Because my man shakes. <laughs> My man gets a migraine if he doesn't have any caffeine before 10 a.m. He gets a migraine, and he's just like, oh, my God, I need a nap or I need caffeine. And he will literally pound an iced coffee without a problem and then get a second one. Like, he goes back to back to back. He gets refills, which is why it's somewhat cost-effective. My man spends thousands at Starbucks, I feel. He must. Like, I don't know. I My little espresso machine at home is just fine for me. But he's addicted to caffeine. He gets a migraine if he doesn't have it. He gets the shakes, okay? You can also go the other way. Have, any, have you ever had enough caffeine that you literally shake? 
Yeah. Okay. That is when you're, she's like, yeah. How did you get caffeine? You take like three, like three days. Still, like, here. That's so disturbing. I drank coffee one time. If I drink the whole thing by, like, third period, that's when I'll be, like, shaking. Oh, my God. Okay. So, the most important thing that you need to know with stimulants is that when you take a stimulant, it literally makes your brain feel like everything is, like, working and everything is on and just, like, hello, everybody. Okay? That's what a stimulant does. Depressants are the opposite. Depressants slow you down, which is what I would write under depressants. Now, depressants decrease the functioning of the nervous system, which means you are feeling less. Okay? What is the most famous depressant? Alcohol. Alcohol. Now, <laughs> what? Xanax. Xanax is a barbiturate, which is a depressant. You're not wrong. Okay? Now, barbiturates are a depressants that have a sedative effect. Xanax calms people down, okay? People abuse it on a pretty regular basis. Um, it calms you down. The most, uh, the most famous one, of course, is alcohol. Now, alcohol, it's really hard for people to understand that it's a depressant, okay? Because people typically drink it when they're out and about socializing and stuff like that. When you turn 21, and you have a beer, and you're like, I'm 21, that's my first beer, this is so exciting. If you have too many beers, you will fall asleep, okay? Like for instance, I had to take my man out this morning at 3.45 this morning, and I walked downstairs to live in a high rise, and there's a bunch of bars downstairs, and I'm just walking my dog at 3.45, and I see a man slumped over in a chair scares the crap out of me. My man was passed out. Just dead. I went over and made sure he wasn't actually dead. Like, there was, like, a heartbeat going on, but I didn't get too close because, like, it's 3.45 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I walked over and I was like, oh, my God. So I told, like, the concierge, being like, uh... So they went over and, like, I was not dealing with it. Yeah! What are they going to do? Oh, hello! No, the guy's drunk. In, in public. <laughs> okay? So, alcohol is a chemical resulting in the fermentation and distil uh, dist 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 distillation. Thank you. Of various kinds of vegetable matter. We'll get to it tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're going to see a bunch of rats get high on drugs. <laughs> it's going to be so exciting. They're like, it's probably one of the best videos we see all year. It really is.